Welcome back to This Week in Immigration. I'm your host, Jack Malde, Senior Policy Analyst at the Bipartisan Policy Center. In this week's episode, BPC Senior Advisor Teresa Cardinal Brown and I chat with Anne Oliva, CEO of the National Alliance to End Homelessness, and Francis Torres, a Senior Policy Analyst in Housing and Infrastructure at BPC, about homelessness in the US. We cover the scale of the issue, its causes, the extent to which increased arrivals at the southern border has exacerbated the issue, and the solutions needed. Stay tuned for this vital discussion. Homelessness has been on the rise since 2017, with an overall increase of 6%. Hundreds of thousands of individuals, primarily single adults, experience homelessness, with about half living unsheltered. While we can all agree this is a pressing issue, the topic of homelessness remains a contentious one, with considerable disagreement over the causes and solutions. The recent rise in arrivals at the southern border and their subsequent travel to cities across the country has raised the question of to what extent migration is a key driver of homelessness. To take us through these issues, we welcome two fantastic guests. First, Anne Oliva is CEO of the National Alliance to End Homelessness a public education, advocacy, and capacity building organization dedicated to ending homelessness in the United States. Anne is a recognized as one of the foremost experts on homelessness in the nation and works closely with members of Congress and the administration, as well as with officials and advocates at the state and local levels. She has previously worked on housing issues at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, the Corporation for Supportive Housing, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Welcome to the podcast, Anne. Thank you so much for having me. Great to have you. Next, we have Francis Torres, a senior policy analyst in housing and infrastructure at BBC, where his research and analysis focuses on policies to address homelessness, tax credit financing for affordable housing, and long-term housing outcomes in disaster recoveries. Francis has previously worked at the Puerto Rico-based think tank Center for a New Economy, where he focused his research and advocacy on housing and disaster recovery in the U.S. Territory. He has also worked at the Washington office on Latin America and at National Journal. So welcome, Francis. Thank you. Great to be here. Great. So let's start with the basics about homelessness in the United States. So Anne, I'm going to turn this to you. Can you tell us about the scale of the issue and who the unhoused are? Sure. Uh, Thank you for the question. It sets the stage nicely for this conversation. So what we know is that on a single night in January of 2023, which is the most recent data that we have, about 653,000 people were experiencing homelessness. Of those folks, about 60% were sheltered. And what I mean by that is that they were living in emergency shelters or transitional housing or some other sheltered location. And about 40% were unsheltered. And what I mean by that is that that's folks who you see living on the streets, Uh, in their cars or other places that are not really meant for human habitation. About 70% of the folks uh, counted on that single night in January of 2023 were single individuals, and about 30% were people who were presenting in families. And I think it's it's important to, to go through a couple of the other data points that we know, just to give our listeners some context. We know that between 2022 and 2023, the number of people experiencing homelessness increased by about 12%. That is a huge year-over-year increase. And in that year, 2023, about close to 36,000 of the people that we counted were veterans, and about 35,000 were people under the age of 25. And the 2023 count is the highest number of people reported as experiencing homelessness on a single night since reporting began in 2007. And all of that data comes from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. It is part of the annual homelessness assessment report. And then the last thing uh, that I want to note here is that people who identify as uh, people of color, that is Black, African American, African people who are indigenous, as well as Latinos, are overrepresented in the population of people who are experiencing homelessness. And about one in five people that were counted that night were age 55 or older. So Anne, 
you know, that's that's sort of the data on who they are. But from that, there's diverse there's a diverse population. So, what are the main causes of homelessness for individuals? Yeah, that's a great question because I think people have a lot of misconceptions about what causes homelessness. So, generally speaking, what happens with an individual or a household varies by that individual or household. Often there's trauma, uh, hardship and poverty, sometimes behavioral health issues like addiction or mental health conditions, job loss, domestic violence, divorce, LGBTQ young people being rejected by their family. All of those things can be factors at the individual level. But what the data tells us is at the systemic level, the main driver of homelessness is a lack of affordable housing. So in other words, as the cost of housing as a percentage of a household's income increases, so does homelessness in that community. We also know that three major things really contributed to that 12% increase that I just talked about uh, between 2022 and 2023. And the first I've already mentioned, that's the affordable housing crisis. People are paying more and more of their income towards rent, which puts them at risk of eviction and homelessness. The second, which we're going to talk about uh, today, is our safety net. It's not keeping up with need. So when the safety net can't provide the services that people need to stay in their housing or get housing, more people fall into homelessness than the homeless system has the capacity to serve. And then the third is that all of this was happening, uh, these skyrocketing rents and uh, gaps in our, in our social safety net, right when all of the resources that were provided during the pandemic were starting to you know, end or expire, like the eviction moratorium and the funding that came with the pandemic. So we really have sort of a, in 2023, we really started to see this perfect storm situation that resulted in that 12% increase. Yeah. And Francis, I know BPC has looked into the issue of housing supply in particular detail. Can you tell us a little bit more about how big that issue is? Sure. Um, and I would just start off by saying that uh, what Anne has uh, laid out is, is exactly right. Uh, in our view, homelessness is a problem that has quite a lot to do with housing. It's in the very name, right? Home, homelessness. Uh, and we've seen from a lot of estimates a range of uh, the undersupply, basically, of, of affordable housing across the country, ranging from 3 million to 7 million to even more homes. We've seen estimates that say that around thir only 33 uh, affordable or rental homes are available for every 100 extremely low income households. So those that are at or below the federal poverty line. Uh, so this is all happening in the context of a significant undersupply of homes, both for rent and for ownership. But in this case, because we're talking about a population that is largely extremely low income, the rental market is, is sort of what we're focusing our attention on. Uh, so this shortage of affordable rental housing really creates a situation that is sort of like a game of musical chairs uh, for folks who are housing insecure. So as fewer chairs become available, some people will end up without one, right? And some of the folks who might find themselves without a chair, or in this case, without housing, to extend the, the metaphor, might see certain exacerbating factors, which are some of the common takeaways people might have about an unhoused person. Perhaps people think they, they have uh, mental health issues or substance use disorders or other issues. But uh, underlying this dynamic is this broader game of musical chairs, this broader lack of options uh, where the people that are perhaps the most vulnerable uh, are falling out of housing security because they cannot access an affordable home, a particularly affordable rental home. So we, uh, BPC has been very focused on providing analysis of how the uh, broader market conditions and market dynamics, such as uh, rent increases and vacancy rates in different parts of the country are exacerbating the problem of homelessness uh, and how they interact with what we might call uh, individual risk factors, uh, but ultimately keeping an eye on this underlying dynamic of how housing markets uh, shifts uh, and the lack of homes is really driving this issue. 
So this is an immigration podcast, so we're going to delve a little bit deeper into the role immigration may or may not play in this issue. Um, is there any actual evidence linking increased immigration or immigration generally with increased homelessness? Or more specifically, because this is in the news, the arrival of the migrants at the southern border? And so let's start with you this time, Francis. Sure. And I want to be careful with this issue. Of course, both homelessness and immigration are sensitive topics. What we know is that in certain places, New York, Chicago, Denver, others, uh, there's been an our influx of immigrants and asylum seekers that uh, seems to have strained shelter systems for people who are unhoused. So folks in need of shelter and uh, these existing systems working to, to meet the needs of everyone who is arriving as well as everyone who was already following into homelessness in those places. There are multiple dynamics to this, right? Some cities have received migrants at different rates than others. There are busing dynamics, there's particularities of the asylum process that might mean that some folks can't legally work and that might impact their ability to access uh, well, the income they need to provide housing for themselves. Ultimately, the, the takeaway that we have in our housing center uh, is that the recent national level data that Anne pointed to from HUD shows a significant increase in homelessness all over the country. So not just in these cities and places where we see some of these dynamics playing out most visibly, so 41 states and the District of Columbia saw increases in their unhoused population from 2022 to 2023 per HUD's count that uh, Anne referred to. And it, the arrival of immigrants and asylum seekers might be straining uh, shelters in certain places, but other factors, such as the historic undersupply of affordable homes, rent increases and evictions, and uh, crucially right now, that phase out of pandemic era policies uh, that kept people housed uh, at a very crucial time are a more significant part of the story at a national level, which is not to downplay the impact that uh, the arrival of migrants and asylum seekers may have had in, in shelter systems, but to point to how this is just one part of a broad story that has many dynamic factors. Yeah, thanks for that, Francis. And Anne, I just want to turn this to you as well. Do you have anything to add regarding immigration as a driver of homelessness? Yeah, I think that what Francis just said is really important to understand the full context. There was an increase across the country that is, uh, a, you know, can be attributed to a number of factors. And in some communities, those factors are further exacerbated by an inflow of new arrivals. And what I think is really important to understand here is that the increase in new arrivals in the homeless system is a symptom of a larger problem. And that is when our systems across this country don't work in the way that they should be working in terms of serving the folks that they are serving. So what I'm talking about here is the criminal legal system, uh, our behavioral health or healthcare system, the child welfare system, and now the immigration system when they don't work what ends up happening is they become feeder systems into the homelessness assistance system. And the homelessness assistance system is not resourced to be able to handle uh, these kinds of large surges that happen. Uh, for example, when the state of Texas buses folks with no notice to these uh, cities across the country. And I will note that 75% of the increase that we saw in 2023 is in Massachusetts, Colorado, New York, Illinois, and California. And those are overlapping with some of the cities that Francis just talked about. Yeah. So we heard on this podcast a couple of weeks ago from Mark Hetfield, who's the president of HIAS, which is one of the national refugee resettlement agencies. And one of the things they do in, is, is help people who've already been approved for refugee status overseas and are brought by the government to the United States, resettle in the United States. And, and one of the challenges that he pointed out right now, and Francis, I think this goes back to something you said earlier, was finding affordable housing for the arriving refugees. Now, the refugees have immediate work authorization. And actually, one of the things that the government provides is help finding that first set of jobs for them and a place to live. That's already have to be arranged before they get here. And yet, 
the agencies that are and, and organizations that are funded by the government to help them find housing are having a hard time finding housing. So you talked previously about the lack of affordable housing. It seems that separate and above from the newest arrivals from the border, that this is a crisis that affects migrants as well as U.S. citizens. Where are these issues most acute, this affordable housing system? Sure. So I, first of all, Teresa, I think you've really hit the nail on the head here. Uh, this is an issue that impacts everyone who happens to be in this country, uh, regardless of their of migratory status. Uh, the lack of affordable homes, it just impacts housing affordability for all households. Uh, so the, the places where we see the most concentrated rates of unsheltered homelessness, so homelessness that is particularly visible on the streets uh, that people might know as they go about their day, do have some characteristics that distinguish them from other places in the country. And there's been a lot of sort of quantitative research on this recently, a great book called uh, Homelessness is a, is a Housing Problem that came out last year uh, that informed that housing market dynamics such as low vacancy rates and rent increases uh, are really determinative in driving the regional variance of homelessness from one city to another. And so places where we see uh, extremely low uh, vacancy rates, so that's how many rental units are available for rent, and really high increases in, in absolute rent, so how much uh, you're paying for a unit, are places where we also see a higher rate of homelessness than uh, cities that maybe have higher vacancy rates or where rent is uh, less expensive. And so again, that all just points back to this underlying mechanism of a musical chair dynamic of a lack of homes, uh, particularly in the places where you know, the, va the low vacancy rate indicates uh, perhaps a lot of people are moving there, uh, there is uh, a lot of reasons to live there, people want to live there, and they're driving up the price of housing. So you know, from our uh, housing team perspective, the solution or one of the important solutions is to provide more affordable housing in the places people want to live. Because inevitably in cities that are often called superstar cities or economic magnet cities like San Francisco, like New York City, et cetera, folks will always continue to want to go there and live there. And yet if their housing supply is um, inflexible, it's uh, just not responding to, to that inflow of, of new people looking for housing, then it's classic Econ 101. The higher demand will mean that there will be a higher asking price for rent. And we see people falling into housing insecurity and ultimately homelessness in the absence of a strong programs that can that can help them stay housed. You know, Mark Mark did mention that a lot of the refugees from Afghanistan want to settle in San Francisco because previous Afghans have settled there, but that's one of the most expensive housing markets in the country, and so that's not really viable for new arrivals. Similarly, aside from the fact that some migrants are being bused by the governor of Texas to New York, many others are coming on their own because. New York is the immigrant city in the world, right? Everyone knows the Statue of Liberty, and so they think that's where they should go. And again, New York has significantly expensive housing. So uh, you're right. Like that's if that's where people want to be, and there's not enough, you, you you create problems. And anything else you want to add on this, the housing affordability and how it impacts all of this? The the only thing that I would add here about the the point that you made about the Office of Refugee Resettlement is that that is actually a coordinated government-led effort yeah. that uh, does look at housing markets across the country. They mm -hmm. help folks with funding and with support. And that is not what we're seeing in this particular crisis, at least on the homeless services side. Folks are entering the homeless services system looking for support and looking for a way to access first safety through shelter and second housing and employment when they are allowed to do so. So there is a very significant difference between what happens when the Office of Refugee Resettlement decides on a community and how that coordination impacts both the systems that are at that local level and the households that are being resettled. Yeah. And and that is something that the gov the the mayors and the governors of these receiving localities of, of the migrants from the border are asking the federal government right now, can you That's do right. something for this group that, you know, coordinate this a little better so that it's not just, you know, sort of happening without that coordination and without looking at the receiving cities. 
We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, we will move on to what the policy solutions might be to address homelessness. So don't go anywhere. So before the break, we covered some of the key drivers of homelessness. Let's move on to the solutions. So Anne, what are some of the most effective solutions to the issue that the National Alliance to End Homelessness is working on? So as I mentioned earlier before the break, the systemic driver of homelessness is a lack of affordable housing. So the number one systemic solution has to be affordable housing. Everybody needs a safe, stable, and affordable place to live whether you are a new arrival to this country or whether you are already a resident uh, of the United States. And many people also need services, services to help them find housing, to address underlying trauma or behavioral health conditions, to find jobs, just to mention a few. And I wanna be clear that these are all high need populations and they should not be pitted against each other for resources. And we actually are already seeing that play out in some of these communities that we talked about before the break. So we need investments in interim strategies and long-term solutions. So we need shelter to keep people safe. We need outreach to make sure that folks who are in unsheltered locations are connected to services and eventually to housing. And we need behavioral health services to address the needs of folks who have those types of conditions. But the policy response on asylum seekers also needs additional short and medium term action. Because while all of the folks in these groups that we're talking about, whether they're asylum seekers or new arrivals uh, or people who are experiencing homelessness or housing instability who are already here, they've all experienced trauma. Expecting the homelessness response system to be responsible for addressing all of those needs just isn't an adequate policy response. So for this particular situation, the Alliance is recommending a few targeted actions that can help communities serve everybody who needs assistance. And we really derived these recommendations based on conversations with communities that are highly impacted right now. So first is uh, requesting additional emergency funding to expand programs like the Shelter and Services Program at the Department of Homeland Security. That could be done through congressional action and potentially through administrative authority uh, to shift funding from other places. The second is to expedite the timeline to process asylum status claims. People are stuck in the system because it takes a long time to process their their claims and they can't sort of move forward until, until that happens. The third is to reduce the amount of time that asylum seekers have to wait before seeking employment. That is another factor that gets people stuck in the homeless services system when they actually could be moving on to employment, which is what people really want to do. That's why they came here. It is uh, very clear to me in my conversations with communities that that's really what most people want to do. And then we touched on the other item, which is federal coordination and trying to ensure that communities are notified before folks are resettled there, that uh, that there's some federal coordination to help support the communities that are receiving folks uh, from the border. So we have heard a lot, especially recently, about New York's so-called right to shelter law um, that is causing a lot of stress in those communities and more, as more and more migrants arrive without places to stay. Does your organization believe that those kinds of laws are effective solutions, either setting aside the recent arrival of the migrants, but were they effective before? Is that the kind of thing that you think is amongst the the most effective solutions? So here at the Alliance, we know that housing is the solution to homelessness. Emergency shelter is never going to be the solution to homelessness. It is an interim strategy to allow people to be safe and to ensure that they can have a path to finding uh, safe and affordable housing and the services that they need. That said, it depends on the community. There are a number of communities that have a version of right to shelter. Massachusetts has a version. The District of Columbia has a right to shelter for families. They're all implemented in different ways. 
And that really has an impact on how successful those right to shelter laws are in connecting people to permanent housing, which is the goal for all systems that serve people experiencing homelessness. So Francis, at BPC, obviously with the Bipartisan Policy Center, so we focus on where there's potential for bipartisan progress. Do we advocate at BPC for similar solutions to those that Anne has outlined? I'll focus on the housing solutions coming from the housing team uh, rather than provide um, solutions on the migration front, which is, of course, more your guys' cup of tea. But on the housing side, it, there is uh, certainly a lot of agreement. And more broadly, I think we see a strong interest from members of both parties and across different levels of government in addressing the housing crisis that the whole country is experiencing, uh, the crisis of housing affordability that is touching communities all over this country. Um, and so we, we see it as a very fertile moment to advocate for some common sense proposals that garner bipartisan support, many of which already have bipartisan support uh, from the federal level. These include proposals like expanding the low income housing tax credit, which is the federal government's primary tool for incentivizing the development of rental housing that is uh, affordable, sort of below market rate rent. And BPC has also been supportive of strengthening the housing choice voucher program uh, for folks who need support in covering their rental costs. However, currently the housing choice voucher program only covers about one in four, just about, of people who qualify for it based on their income. And also, even among those who do receive uh, vouchers, we see that a lot of them are unable to use them for different reasons, and many landlords are not uh, participating in the program. So we also advocate for measures that will make it easier or will incentivize landlords to take up tenants who are paying with uh, vouchers or using vouchers. Uh, and broadly as well, we've been supportive of more permanent emergency rental assistance program, like the one we saw during the pandemic which helped households and families experiencing housing insecurity keep their housing and avoid falling into homelessness. We think that there is a room in the, in the federal policy making space for a more long-term program to really keep people housed as we see that uh, quite a lot of the, the pathways into homelessness can just be a family missing a rental payment or just any kind of momentary setback that might lead you to an eviction and to, to eventually not having a place to stay. So we think that this preventative measure can go quite a long way in addressing this problem. And then more broadly, we've also seen a good examples of how to address homelessness from the federal side. Uh, the U.S. Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing Vouchers Program, which were vouchers for unhoused veterans, it has achieved a 55% reduction in the number of unhoused veterans, at least from 2010 to 2020, and largely on the strength of providing a dedicated voucher for uh, veterans that were experiencing homelessness or at risk of it alongside a supportive services for veteran families. So broadly speaking, the federal government has already uh, shown the case for how it's targeted resources to provide these vouchers and provide support uh, for families experiencing housing insecurity can really make the difference. And we're broadly supportive of efforts to uh, build on that example and expand these programs I've mentioned. And um, I'd be interested in your sense of prospects for reform in Congress. Um, has your organization been ha able to have productive conversations with both parties about these issues? We often have productive conversations with both parties on a number of issues related to housing and homelessness. Uh, we know that there are bills, for example, on, on the issue that we're talking about today from Senator Collins and others that would shorten the amount of time that folks have to wait before they can seek employment, for example. We also know that you know, Congresswoman Waters has a bill that's the Ending Homelessness Act, which actually has universal vouchers, as Francis mentioned, uh, integrated into that proposal. Now, neither of those right now have a path forward uh, in terms of being able to, to pass. But we know that members of Congress are paying attention to a number of these issues. And the other thing I'll say here is that this is tricky. I am not an immigration expert. Uh, I am a homelessness expert. So I can really only look at this through, through our lens. 
And we know that there are a number of communities out there that we've talked to that are disappointed that the Bipartisan Border Act uh, didn't make it through the Senate, because while it was not perfect, according to the folks that we're talking about, uh, it did include a number of the things that we have been recommending, like accelerated uh, work authorization process, increased funding to process asylum claims more quickly, money for FEMA's shelter and services program, all of those things uh, were included there. And I know that a number of the communities that we talked to have been disappointed that it hasn't moved forward. So we're tracking a number of things, both on the homelessness side uh, related to affordable housing and services, as well as on um, this particular issue of new arrivals so that we can educate members of Congress and the administration when we need to, when critical votes are coming up. Mm-hmm. And Francis, last year BPC did some polling on homelessness to understand the views of the general public. Is there anything you want to flag from that research? Certainly. So last year, the Bipartisan Policy Center collaborated with Morning Consult to field a nationally representative poll to determine public views on homelessness. And if there's one thing I would like to leave the audience with was that we received this really clear result uh, across party lines of respondents looking to federal government and looking to presidential campaigns to address the issue of homelessness. So traditionally, homelessness uh, is seen as an issue for local governments to address. Uh, And yet, we have seen a very high percentage, a plurality of our respondents, uh, saying that federal government has a responsibility to address this issue. Um, And a very high percentage of respondents looking to the presidential campaigns in this particular presidential cycle to speak to the issue. So one takeaway we really want everyone to to get from that is that federal government has a responsibility to play here. And uh, those who are campaigning to be president or otherwise take up key roles in federal government should be speaking to this concern as it is increasingly a top concern for communities all over the country. Finally, Anne, how optimistic are you that we can address the issue? I, I hear your disappointment in the Senate border bill. I think we share it too. I mean, it's we 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 applaud any efforts of bipartisanship on an issue like immigration, but on the specific issue of homelessness, how are you feeling about the chances of some steps forward? I have to be optimistic. I should not be the CEO of the National Alliance to End Homelessness if I do not carry some optimism about our ability and the political will to actually end homelessness in this nation. Uh, We have a lot of work to do. We have a a tough environment that we're working in. But what my hope is, is that our elected leaders and at at all levels, at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, will see these numbers and see people who are really suffering in their communities, and they will take that as a call to action to address these systemic issues that, especially affordable housing and the kinds of services that people need access to to maintain that housing. What I'm hoping, like I said, is is that folks take this as a call to action and that they will uh, act accordingly. Well, great. I think we'll end the discussion there. But Anne and Francis, thank you so much for joining us on This Week in Immigration. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And that's a wrap on this episode of This Week in Immigration. One last reminder to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform, and share it with your friends and colleagues. You can also find our podcast episodes on the Bipartisan Policy Center YouTube channel. You can find more information on all the issues we discuss here on the show at bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration. You can follow the Bipartisan Policy Center on the X platform at BPC underscore bipartisan. You can follow Teresa Cardinal Brown at BPC underscore T Brown. And you can follow me at Jack Malday. Send your comments and feedback to us by email to immigration at bipartisanpolicy.org. I'm Jack Malday. This Week in Immigration was created and executive produced by Teresa Cardinal Brown. This episode was written by myself and Teresa Cardinal Brown. Joshua Joe is our audio editor. The executive producer of BBC Podcasts is Lucy Manning. Talk to you next time on This Week in Immigration. Thank you.